So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are especially excited this week because this week we have been celebrating World Oceans Day, which is today. It's June 8th on Friday. But we've done 45 hangouts with researchers, research vessels, explorers, scientists from all around the globe, highlighting oceans and the important role they play in our world. Uh, this is, in fact, our very last hangout of Oceans Week. So for the classes that have joined us before, thank you so, so much for being here. For the classes joining us for the first time, it's great to have you. Right now, we have five classes from across North America joining us. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Miss Lowen's grade one. Lowen's grade one. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Wow, so many of you. We've got Mr. Ribbon, Lady Nine from Portland, DC. These four tables can be sharing. We've got Miss Lackey's Grade Fives in Freehold, New Jersey. I think we've had every class in Freehold, New Jersey over the course of this week. We have Miss Cameron Sixth in Maple Ridge. Maple Ridge. And last but not least, we have Miss Hilda Biddle's Grade Fives uh, from Marlton, New Jersey, as well. Hi, guys. Awesome. That mic's muted, but we feel your enthusiasm. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Alaska from her back porch uh, with Dr. or with Elizabeth Kruger, a Senior Program Officer at Arctic Wildlife for the World Wildlife Foundation or World Wildlife Fund. You guys are both. You have been both. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth leads their efforts to ensure that polar bears and other Arctic marine mammals can coexist peacefully with native and other communities. And she does all sorts of great work up there. Her bio goes on forever, but I'll leave her to share the great work that she does. Elizabeth, thank you so, so much for joining us. And without further ado, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you could join me this morning. And um, sit here with me on my back porch while I show you a little bit about Alaska and the places where I work. So it's, um, I am, as was said, I'm the um, lead for polar bears and other Arctic wildlife in Alaska. And so one of my favorite places to work is where we're gonna talk about today. Let me share my screen. Uh oh, my mouse went away, here we go. Okay, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else saw that, but that was pretty cool. You're in, you're good. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so here we are, and this map should look familiar to most of you. And so if you can each find where you live on this map and point to it right now, so that you know where we all are, oriented in this world. All right, now that everybody's found where you are, I'm gonna show you where I am. So we're gonna zoom up into the top left corner over there. And this is Alaska, Canada to the very far right, Alaska in the middle, and to the left, that other landmass is Russia. And today we're gonna go right to the spot in between Alaska and Russia. And we call that the Bering Strait. You might have heard of the Bering Strait before. Um, it's, it was at one time the Bering Land Bridge, and that's where it's thought that most of the people came and first populated North America from Asia. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is show you just a little bit about our ecosystem up here. To me, this is one of the coolest places in the world because it's actually the richest sea in the world. It has what we like to call the highest primary productivity. And that is up at the top right corner of your screen. That's that phytoplankton bloom, or really that phytoplankton bloom that comes off of the ice algae. The algae forms under the ice as the ice is starting to get thinner, the sun can reach it, it's starting to get all those sun rays and do photosynthesis and get really happy. And then it feeds the other little larger creatures, which then go on and feed the other slightly bigger creatures. 
And a lot of that filters down to the bottom. And ultimately it comes all the way back up to the top predators in the Arctic. So that's just a brief introduction. And now we're gonna go on to the place that I really wanna talk about. So you can see here in the very middle of the screen, you see something that's called, you see words, the Bering Strait. And just to the right of that, you see a town called Wales. That's not the Wales, the country, that's Wales, the village in Alaska. There's about 150 people who live there and most of them are Inupiat um, Eskimo. There is also two little islands you can see in the very middle of the Bering Strait. And one of those is called Little Diomede Island. That's the little one. That one is US territory and there's actually another Inupiat village on that island. Um, and they look every day, they wake up and they see Big Diomede Island, which is right across, a couple miles across, and it's actually part of Russia. And in the very middle, running between those two islands, is the International Dateline. And that's the thing that divides today from tomorrow. So when you wake up in the morning on Little Diomede Island and you look over to um, the west, you're actually looking at Russia and you're also looking at the future. You can see tomorrow. And this is what that looks like. This first picture you can see is the village of Wales. That's the entire village there's nobody else that lives around there for another about 70 miles from there, 150 people. That big building in the very middle is the school. And just above that on the horizon, you can actually see those two Diomede Islands. So that's standing on the U.S. side of the, of the Bering Strait and you're looking all the way across at, at Russia. So I have a question for all of you. How many of you walked to school this morning? Let me go back to this one. Raise your hand if you walked to school. Couple hands. Couple okay. Hands. Yeah. If you didn't walk to school, raise your hand if you took the bus. Ooh, lots of hands. Lots of hands, okay. And I'm guessing that if you didn't take the bus, you probably rode your bike or got dropped off by um, an adult. Now, in this village here, you can see it's pretty darn small. And actually, there are almost no cars in the entire village. And part of that is because there's no roads. The only way to get to Wales is to fly by plane, or you can take a boat in the summertime, or you can go by snow machine or four wheeler. And so most people in the village, that's their primary mode of transportation is in the winter, um, snow machine or four wheeler, and in the summertime, uh, four wheeler and a boat to get around. So how do kids get to school in Wales? Well, a lot of them walk. Some of them, if they're lucky, their parents have snow machines and they can drop them off. Or really, those are their only two options. And a few years ago, people from this community came to uh, the organization that I work for, uh, World Wildlife Fund, and they actually did it through the Alaska Native Co-Management Body for Polar Bears which was called at the time the Alaska Nanook Commission. And they said, you know, we've got a problem. We're really worried about our kids when they come to school. What are some reasons, you can just tell your teacher really quick, what are some reasons why you might be worried when you're walking to school for your safety? For me, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, and in Anchorage, we actually have moose that live in the, in the city, and we have bears that live in the city. 
I have only very rarely ever seen bears in the city, but I do see moose almost all the time. And those can be kind of scary, believe it or not. They can, they can be pretty uh, intimidating. Now, kids in Wales have a different animal that they're concerned about on their way to school. In this picture, it's a nice, bright, sunny day. I believe this was taken in around March. Um, and so it's springtime, there's lots of sun. But as we know, when you get really high up into the Arctic in the winter time, there's almost no daylight. It, the sun rises for an hour or two at this latitude and then it sets for the rest of the day. And so the kids are walking to school in the dark. And this village is right in the middle of polar bear country. Polar bears in this area range between the US and Russia. A lot of them are born over on the Russian side and then they come over to the Alaskan side when they're a little bit older. So the people in the village came to the Nenet Commission and uh, WWF and said, you know, we'd really like a way to keep the kids safe. And, it's, you know, we'd, we'd like to do it in a way where we don't have to kill the polar bear if that's not something we want to do. And we said, OK, we've actually got some experience doing that in other parts of the world in Canada. WWF started a program in Arviat in Nunavut. Uh, we also helped start a program in uh, Russia, in the village of Vankarem in Chukotka, which is across the Bering Strait. And now WWF also helped start a program in Greenland, in the village of Itaka Tormit. So we uh, went to the village and we made sure that everybody there was on board with the idea and we asked them, what would you like to see in a, in a program to help kids stay safe. And they said, we'd like to set up a polar bear patrol. And that polar bear patrol should be watching the village for polar bears and making a, a checking the perimeter and looking for footprints or bears, especially at the times when kids are walking to school in the morning and when people are walking home in the evening. And then the polar bear patrol also decided that they could act as a school bus. But instead of a being a school bus, they actually all hop into this sled that's being pulled by a snow machine. So in this picture, we're doing a training where we got the patrol together. There's about six guys and we decided we needed to do some real life scenarios. And so, um, JR here is wearing a polar bear hat and he's also got a stuffed polar bear in his arm. And his job was to play the role of being a mama polar bear with her cub. And so he had to go hide in the village and he made some tracks. And then the patrollers w started walking after him and looking at the tracks and trying to see where that polar bear went. And then they would try to chase him out of the village. And the idea is to keep polar bears in the area that is wild, where people don't expect to be safe, and keep people within the village feeling like they are safe from polar bears. This is another part of the training at a different time of the year where we were using, uh, we were trying out different types of um, what we call deterrents. And a deterrent just means it's, it's something you use to make the polar bear not want to do whatever it's doing. And you want it to, you want to scare it away from the village. And so there's a few ways we do that. But, and you can see in everybody's hands, they've got a, what looks like a, a can. It's not hairspray. It's actually called bear spray. And those of you in BC are probably familiar with bear spray. If you don't know how to use it, make sure to read the instructions because you don't spray it on yourself like bug spray. You spray it at the bears and it has um, a chemical in it that makes the bears eyes sting and it makes it hard for them to breathe. It's the same basically as what's in pepper spray. 
that people use on other people. The other thing you can do is you can um, have a, a bean bag and instead of putting a um, ammunition into a shotgun, you can put that bean bag round into the shotgun. And when you fire that out, the bean bag about the size of your hand it, or the palm of your hand, it unfolds and it comes out as a square and it is intended to just kind of smack that bear on where the seat of its pants would be. So you can see in these cutouts, we made some targets to practice doing that. And you can see that everybody's aiming for the rear end of that bear because that's the part where it's gonna, it's gonna hurt a little bit and it's gonna scare the bear away, but it's not going to be lethal, which means the bear is not gonna die. Now this, let's see if this will work. This is um, a scenario, which is a don't try this at home kids type scenario. That's actually me in that red coat and uh, Clyde Axarak is holding on to my boot so I don't fall in. And you can see there's a GoPro, well, you can't really see it. There's a GoPro at the end of that stick and it's under the water. And this is right at what we call the ice edge. And you can see all that snow is on top of the ice. All that water is a prime habitat and wonderful area for all the marine mammals that live in this place. All those marine mammals are coming from, at this time of year, and, and this was again in March, at this time of year, they're all coming up from the southern part, from the Bering Sea and the rest of the Pacific Ocean, all that water. They're, all those migratory marine mammals are coming up through that really narrow Bering Strait and going up to the Arctic where they feed for the summer. And so I stuck a GoPro in there because I was a little bit curious to hear or to see actually what would be down there. So I'm gonna see if I can play this for you. When I brought the GoPro back to the computer and put the file on the, on the computer, I started watching it and I couldn't see almost anything. It was really, really murky. But remember at the very beginning of this presentation where I talked about the high primary productivity, the reason it's murky is because of all of that algae and plankton that are in the water at this time of year. That's the food for all of the bigger critters. So I couldn't see anything and I was kind of disappointed, but uh, RJ was actually sitting behind me at the time and he said, hey, turn up the volume. And I turned up the volume and all of a sudden we realized there was something pretty cool on there. I don't think that. I don't think it is. It's going to work. Sorry about that. No. Nice try. Going on, moving on. Uh, I'll see if I can play it for you at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. Okay. Moving on, this is just a little bit more about the ecosystem here. As you can see, we've got ice, and in that ice are is the entire ecosystem, which we talked about a little bit earlier, and those include bowhead whales, uh, walrus, polar bears, and seals. And then there's also climate change is starting to happen and we've seen it really strongly in the Arctic. This year, in fact, in the winter, there were periods where there was open water in the Bering Strait and that's almost unheard of. So as the, the carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere and the climate is warming, we're starting to see a decrease in sea ice in the summertime. And that means uh, that the habitat is shrinking for the marine mammals, but it also means that the Arctic Ocean is literally opening up for other people to start coming in and, and exploiting it. And so we're starting to see ships come through and we're starting to see oil and gas development in the Arctic. 
And so one of the things that we do is to try to make sure that the ships stay out of the way of the animals and that oil and gas, that oil spills are prevented so that we don't have harmful effects on these marine mammals. And with that, I would like to just let you know that WWF does have a wild classroom and this is the uh, web link to go to that. And if you're interested, you can learn a lot more about polar bears on there because we actually put together a polar bear toolkit uh, to go check that out. Let me see if I can play that. Um, yeah. That song for you guys. While you're getting that up, I'll just mention that I'll pass along the Wild Classroom link to all the classes when we're done. Uh, you guys can see it on screen now, but we'll send it just uh, in case. I got rid of it. <laughs> okay, well, while I'm doing this, do you, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, um, to take some questions, or if people want to get questions ready, be okay. happy to answer those. Great. Well, I can go to the first class, and first of all, thank you so, so much for that, Elizabeth. That was wonderful. And uh, yeah, let's go to Miss Start. All right, does someone have a question? I do. Travis? Um, how do you like um, catch the, like how do you get the polar bears away? So, did you hear that? Yep, that's a great question. There are many different ways to do that. And so we actually like to call it a toolbox of different deterrence methods. And we like to start out with the least scary thing we can do. And so usually that means clapping your hands really loud and yelling at the bear and saying, hey bear, you're in the wrong place. And letting that bear know that you're a person and you don't want it there. And then if that doesn't work, you can start doing stuff that's a little more scary. So we might use an air horn, make a louder noise. Um, we might use, we might fire off like a starter pistol, uh, like they do at races. And uh, that can be enough to scare a bear off. We might rev the snow machine or the four wheeler, which can scare a bear off. And then if that doesn't work, then we go up to things like those bean bags or the bear spray. But so basically the idea is nobody knows what that bear just went through right before it came and saw you. Maybe it was having a really good day. Maybe it just caught a big seal and it was super full and it felt really happy. And it's really gonna be scared away pretty easily because it doesn't want to mess with you. Or maybe it just had a run in with another bear and it's really hungry, it hasn't eaten for a while, and maybe it's a younger male, which are kind of like teenage boys, and they kind of feel like they're invincible, but they're also really curious, and uh, so they're actually some of the ones that are the hardest to scare away, because they're not so good at hunting yet. They've just been kicked out by mom, and they really are interested in coming in and checking out what's in that village. Awesome. I like how the social commentary became part of that as well. <laughs> uh, alongside, I just want to mention, we have classes, quite a few classes watching online on YouTube as well. If you guys want to submit questions in the chat bar there, I'll pass them on as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but so I did find that sound file. Oh, okay. Perfect. And I'll just play it for you right now. So, so remember um, what we were looking at. We were looking at that... Uh, that white snow and that dark water. And when we were standing out there, all we could hear is kind of a shh noise of the wind. And we could hear the crunching of people's boots on the snow and nothing else. And then we put that GoPro in the water and all of a sudden we heard this. Can you hear that? Alien. Okay. 
Does anyone know what that is? Oh, okay, there's a kid that's actually like jumping up and down in one of the classes. So Miss Lackey's class, the kid who knows what it is. Please tell us, what is it? What is it? Whale. Go ahead. Whale. 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 Is it a whale? It is not a whale. Ooh, okay. Does anyone else put up your hand in any other class if you think you know? Okay, okay. We're gonna go to. <laughs> we'll go to uh, Miss Presley's class who joined us late. If you guys, oh, Miss Hilda Biddle. If you guys, yeah, Miss Hilda Biddle's class. If you guys want to go for it, just demute your mic. Come tell us what you think it is. So many guesses. Yeah, Marlton guys, April's class. Hi guys, if you want to try. Yeah, yeah, come and tell us, but you got to demute your mic. You got to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on up. I can't do it. I'm sorry. So just check the mic, and then what do you think? Not a whale. Not a narwhal. I'll give you guys a hint. Okay. It's something that polar bears sometimes eat. You are right. It is a kind of a seal. Nice. That sound is actually a bearded seal. And the word for bearded seal in Inupiaq is ugruk. Can you all say ugruk? Ugruk. Ugruk. What do you think? Let's see if we can all say ugruk together. Now, what do you think that ogrook might have been trying to say? Why would it want to make that sound? Okay, Miss Presley's class, what do you think? Stay out your territory. Stay out your territory. That's one really good reason why uh, seals might want to say something. What's another reason? Go away. Go away. Go away. Absolutely, that could be another reason. Any others? Let's check Miss Cameron's class. Do you guys have a thought? Uh, what do you think? Cool. What do you think? What, what do you think the seal's trying to say? Give me food. Give me food. <laughs> food. food. That's a really good reason. <laughs> um, none of those are what that seal was saying. What's one more re one more reason you might think of, and then I'll uh, spill the beans. Okay, so we'll go to Miss Richards' class. Sorry, I've got to unmute. Oh, no, you're good. We're good? Okay, what do you think it is then? Mating calls. Mating calls. Mating calls. You guys are right. So that was in April, and that's right around the time when the Ugrooks are looking for lady Ugrooks because they want to make some baby Ugrooks. And that's the song that they play to that the lady Ugrooks think is really attractive. So I'll play it again and see if you agree. Very attractive. Well, I'm pretty sure I would want to go check out that Ugrook if I heard that sound. Are there, so this is actually one of the reasons that we are working on the, the shipping that I mentioned earlier, because ships also make sounds. And if those ships are going through that area while the Ugrooks are trying to talk to each other, they might not be able to hear each other. And the same thing goes for other types of marine mammals. All of the whales and like you guys said earlier, the narwhals, um, the other seals, the walrus, they all talk to each other underwater. And so one of the things we're working on is trying to figure out how do you make ships quieter so that they disturb the animals less. Excellent. All right. Uh, that was awesome. Okay, let's go to our second class. So Miss Richards' class, if you guys have a question now, if you'd like to ask, come on up. Does anybody have a question? Electric motor? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You can ask questions about Arctic wildlife in general, guys, but just come on up to the camera. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> What's your favorite kind of seal? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. Uh, it, it depends on what you're, what you're looking for. But I would say that ribbon seals are beautiful. Okay. But I also really liked, I like ring seals. And I like ogrooks. And I like spotted, I like all the seals. Seals are awesome. Actually, my real answer to that question is a seal that's not even in the Arctic. It's a seal that lives in a place where I used to live, which is Lake Baikal. It's in Siberia, which is in Russia, just north of Mongolia. And that lake is landlocked. It's very, very far away from any ocean. And yet somehow there are seals that live in that lake and they're freshwater seals. Those are pretty cool. Very cool. Uh, all right, let's go to Miss Lockie's class. Do you guys have a question? All right. Hi. Hi. We're coming. Thank you, Tom. Hi. Are there any invasive species affecting the Arctic right now? Yes, that's an excellent question. There are uh, invasive species in the Arctic, um, and we're starting to see just in general populations moving north as the climate becomes a little bit more hospitable to them. And so if they're used to living in the ocean at a certain temperature, and then the area where that temperature is where they like it is increasing, they're gonna move into that new territory. So we're starting to see certain types of fish and certain crabs and other things moving north and it's changing the ecosystem. But I'm glad you mentioned that because that's another thing that increased shipping traffic can bring. So ships have what's called bilge water and they take it on in one place to help them sail and then they might let it out in another place. And as they're doing that, they might bring a bunch of critters with them, maybe little tiny microscopic ones. But if they let it out in a place where those animals can survive, they might grow into be big animals and they might tr start colonizing there. So yes, we do have invasive species and we're trying to minimize um, the impact of that. I've also loved all week long how many people have kept the word critters alive. I thought it was dying and it's coming back and it's great. Uh, you can only say animal and wildlife so many times. <laughs> all right, Ms. Right, class. class. Have you ever had an encounter with a narwhal? Oh, uh, uh, I have no. I would love to, um, but actually, this part of the world we don't have narwhals very often. We've had. A few of them that have come into Alaska and have gone through the Bering Strait, but those ones we're pretty sure are lost. And sometimes they're just tagging along with a beluga pod because narwhals and belugas are pretty similar, um, relatively speaking. And so we don't we don't expect to see them here very much. I have had some pretty close encounters with polar bears though. Well, we'll have to follow up on that in a future question. But for now, we'll go to Miss Hultabiddle's class. The very patient kid has been waiting the whole time. If you guys have a question, again, just come on up, demute your mic, and uh, we'll be good to go. You got it? You're good. Um, what's the most endangered species in the Bering Strait? What's the most endangered species in the Bering Strait? Great. Great. The most endangered species in the United States. I do not have the answer to that. That's a Bering Strait. Bering Strait. Oh, in the Bering Strait. I heard the United States. Got it. Um, in the Bering Strait right now, you know, we're in actually a really interesting situation where the the ecosystem is doing really well right now. It's really uh, one of the last remaining places in the world that is really functioning the way it's functioned for thousands of years. 
So what we're doing is trying to make sure that it can be as resilient as possible and stay that way um, as long as possible. So we recognize that things are changing and uh, new industries are coming in and people are starting to do new things. And we're trying to make it so that that has the least impact on this intact ecosystem as possible. Excellent. Uh, we had a class join us right about five minutes in. So Miss Presley's class, if you guys in Virginia Beach, if you guys come up, demute your mic, take your time. <laughs> and uh, if you have a question, go for it. I mean, you've got seals right already. So you're, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, little microphone symbol top of your screen, guys. There you go, you're good. Um, Maya, what's your favorite animal? My favorite animal? Man, that's like, uh, that's a really, really tough question. I, I like all animals. Um, I think my favorite animal is probably humans. Uh, humans are pretty darn interesting. But uh, in the Arctic, I think it's actually an animal that I don't work on very much, and I, I don't study them, but wolverines. If you can learn about wolverines, those are really, really cool animals. The other ones I really like are cephalopods. So that includes octopus. And octopus are like the closest you're going to get to interacting with an alien from out of space. Pretty cool. Awesome. And Wolverine, by the way, not Hugh Jackman, uh, Turbo Weasel. Think that way. Okay. Uh, we have a question from a group online. So Mr. Chris's class in Canton, Michigan asks, are there any animals that are now threatened or endangered because of ships coming into the Bering Strait? Well, shipping is one threat. So the um, it's not the it's not the primary threat for any of those species, but it is a major contributing threat. And it's one that's going to increase as, as time goes on. So it really depends on the species. Um, the primary threat to most of the ecosystem is the loss of sea ice habitat, because all of those animals are dependent on that sea ice. Their food comes from the algae that grows underneath the sea ice. So the entire ecosystem, the entire food web is attached to that ice. And then animals, critters like polar bears and seals and walrus, they actually use that ice as a platform where they carry out most of their lives. And so by far the primary threat is um, climate change and it's up to all of us to, to figure that one out. Excellent. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have time for one more round of questions with the classes? Sure. I know it's getting near the end of the school day for the class, so if you have to leave, that's quite all right. Uh, we can always pass on questions later, but we'll start with Miss Lowenstein. Does someone else have a question? Oh, I do. I do. Oh, I'm speaking Yeah. How do, you clean, how do you clean up the uh, oil from the ocean, from the ships? Good yeah, that is really hard to do. Um, you might have heard of something called the Exxon Valdez, and that's an oil spill that happened probably before all of you were born, um, but it happened further south in Alaska. And one of the lessons we learned from that is that it's really, really tough to clean up oil. You guys might also have seen some news about the Gulf of Mexico and the oil spill that happened down there. Now, if that if something like that were to happen in Alaska, it it was difficult enough in Mexico in the Gulf of Mexico with um, getting the all the equipment that you need to come in and coordinating all the rescue operations and things like that. That was really really tough, and they were actually had people come down from up this far north to help them out. Now, in Alaska, in the Bering Strait, if there were an oil spill, the nearest Coast Guard location. Uh, where they could send up some help is about five days away in good weather and good sailing conditions. And there's also no hotels in that area. There's nowhere to put people up. There's no, there's actually, um, in most of the houses in, in the village of Wales, there's no running water, there's no sewage. And so just hosting the cleanup crews would be a big challenge. So we hope that doesn't happen. Better ways of 
transporting role come about? Yep, uh, that's one thing we're working on all the time. Yes, you are. Uh, all right, we'll go back to Ms. Richards' class. There was a student who was like so keen, they jumped the gun earlier, so let's do it. <laughs> all right. Go for it. What's the biggest polar bear you've ever seen? Ah, uh, okay, well, the biggest, you know, I don't know how much the biggest one actually weighed. The one that I was with while they were weighing it, and I helped to weigh it, um, was 1,216 pounds, I believe. And you'll have to convert that into kilograms for Canadians, um, which I can't do in my head. <laughs> and But I, I have to tell you, one time I was in um, Churchill in Manitoba, and I was watching um, polar bears there, and I was telling people about polar bears while they were on their on their polar bear watching trips. And I saw this polar bear that sat down and it had rolls of fat, like its feet got covered up by its tummy when it sat down and it had uh, rolls coming up the sides. It was the healthiest looking polar bear I have ever seen. Okay, by comparison, and, and we use pounds a lot too in Canada, uh, for a class of like grade one to three students, it's like 20 kids in one bear, basically. So think of it that way. Yeah, uh, they can get really big. And they can get 10 or 12 feet long, too. So if they stand up on their hind legs, that's like two adults standing on top of each other. They're the biggest land carnivore, are they not? So that's an interesting question. There's actually... Okay. Um, Canada and the U.S. are not totally in agreement, I believe, about how they um, categorize polar bears. So in the U.S., we say that polar bears are a marine mammal. And I believe in Canada, you say they're a terrestrial mammal. So, you know, that's a, that's a question for, that's a philosophical question. We'll fight it out, but they're big and powerful. They're huge, and they are definitely the top of the food chain other than people. Uh, they are the primary predator. Okay, let's go back to Ms. Lackey's class. Second question. What do you picture as the future of the Arctic ecosystem? Oh, <laughs> well, I have a dream for the Arctic ecosystem. Uh, I. I think at this point we are we're sure that things are changing. Uh, we're not we we as humanity have already committed to a certain amount of climate change because of the carbon we've already admitted into the atmosphere. So we know that the sea ice conditions are going to change, and that's going to have an impact on the ecosystem. Aside from trying to keep this ecosystem intact and um, and around the way it's been for for thousands and thousands of years um, we also want to see the habitat stay intact as well and be able to support life and so like we talked about earlier where some species are gradually starting to move north that might happen and we want to make sure that there's an intact ecosystem and there's a that the, the habitat is able to support a healthy ecosystem no matter what that ecosystem ends up being but right now we have not lost hope on the creatures that are out there and out there right now and i i think that we will continue to see an arctic with um with the creatures that we're working on right now excellent uh that's a very hopeful thought and I sure hope that people like you are keeping up the great work to make it possible. So, okay, we'll go to Miss Cameron's class. You guys have a second. Uh, what's your most dangerous encounter with an animal? Hmm. Huh. Wow. I think you might have stumped me there. Um. You know, I would have to say that it's it's here in Anchorage when I um was was riding a bike actually on the coastal we have a coastal trail that goes through some woods and i rode my bike um and i saw something out of the corner of my eye and then i turned around and looked back and it was a big big black bear and he was just sitting right at the edge of the trail 
And if I'd reached my arm out, I could have tapped him on the nose. And I think he was people watching because he was just sitting there and people were going by. And I don't think most people noticed him, but I sure was, uh, sure was, I made sure to take a different route home, put it that way. He had a bag of popcorn and everything. Yeah, uh, he, he seemed really enthralled. Okay. Let's go to Miss Hiltavittle's class. Uh, if you guys have a second question, just demute and go from there. Sorry for the trouble, guys. Yeah. You're good. You're good. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Leanna. What made you want to be a marine biologist? Hi. So, Hi. so, so I'm actually not a biologist, but I have learned um, a lot about biology on the job. And, you know, I think when I was your age, up until I was probably um, in my mid 20s, I wanted to do everything. And um, I was told in college that I actually couldn't major in everything, that that was a bad idea. And so I had to pick something. And I actually ended up studying Russian language and theater. Um, I, I uh, did some lighting design for theater, was my first uh, job path. And I, I took Russian and I ended up moving to Russia after I graduated from college and living in Siberia for about four years. And I got really um, immersed in the Russian culture and Russian language. And that has opened the door to a lot of interesting job paths that I never thought I would take, uh, including, including this one. And I absolutely love it. Um, so that's a plug for learning a language which sets you apart from the rest of the crowd when it comes to um to to doing other other types of work okay cool uh it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that you're in theater or we're in theater theater people <laughs> uh all right let's go back for a last question with miss presley's class so yeah guys just come on up and uh go for it just, yep you need the mic and then you're you're good hi yep. I'm Caleb. What is your weirdest marine life that you encountered? The weirdest one? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, well, marine life is weird. I mean, just in general, <laughs> especially if you go way down deep. Um, I would say that there's some, there's some very weird critters in, um, again, in Lake Baikal. There's a lot of species that are only found there. There's some fish that are a huge percentage of their body is made up of fat. And so you can actually fry them in a pan without putting any butter or oil in there. They just kind of melt. Um, there's fish that give live birth to their young, which might go against what you learned about in science class. Um, and, but there's, there's critters out there that just kind of defy the rules. Um, and I think, let's see, in, um, oh, you know what's really cool? There was one whale, uh, I wasn't there, but a couple years ago, you can look up on the Pribilof Islands, it was actually a group of kids uh, uh, in the school who discovered a new whale species just a couple years ago. And so there are enormous creatures in the ocean that humans still don't know about. Very cool. Elizabeth, that was marvelous. What a great presentation. Um, so what we do at the end of every Hangout is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So Ms. Lowen's class, Ms. Richard's class, Ms. Lockheed's class, Ms. Cameron's class, the whole shebang. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today. Uh, Elizabeth, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you for ending off our Asians Week. That was great. Cool. Yeah, happy to do it. That was super fun. Awesome. For the classes that are here too, so we'll send you the wildclassroom.org link uh, if you want to find out more. Elizabeth, is there a place where groups can look into other than Wild Classroom to find out more about your work? Or Absolutely. Um, if you go to worldwildlife.org or panda.org um, and look under Arctic, you, you will find it. Yep. 
Excellent. And for the classes, I know a lot of you have joined us for other Hangouts this week, but all our Hangouts go straight online. So you can watch anything you want about deep sea creatures, about, you know, tropical oceans, Arctic wildlife, anything you'd like. Uh, but thank you so, so much for being a part. And guys, 